Now let's like to talk about IETF documents. All IETF documents are open. Anybody can download them, make copies of them, try to make money off of them. For early IETF, uh, the SRI used to take copies of RFCs, package them up into books, and sell those books mostly to libraries. The IETF's fine with that. There's no, no problem. We want to get our documents out there. We're not going to charge you for them, but if you can figure out a way to charge others, all the better to you. The column on the left is the uh, excerpt from the IETF legal provisions relating to IETF documents. It tells you what the rights, your rights are and others' rights are to IETF documents. And the arrow's pointing to the fact that anybody can download and make copies in full, as long as they're in full. You can't take, you can't take a subsection and then uh, modify that and call it some, a new document. But you can copy the entire document and publish it any way you want. There, there are two different classes of documents for the IETF. One is internet drafts. There are, there are working documents. There are the documents that are being used in process. They're non-archival, meaning that they do get saved, but there's no particular meaningful level of consensus on any internet draft. It could be some individual's musings. It could be the product of a working group that's been working on it for years. Uh, you, there's ways to tell in general, but you can't, le you can't tell what actual level of support a particular document internet draft has. Uh, you can just tell that it's in the process. Then we have RFCs. RFCs used to stand for Request for Comment. Back in the early days, they were that. Somebody would publish something and ask for comments on what they published, and they published them as an RFC. But these days, RFC stands for RFC. By the time it gets to be an RFC, it's too late to comment on it. You comment during the, work, the internet draft phase. So these are archival publications. Once they're published, they are never changed. Uh, they are always the same, exactly the same. If you downloaded a copy of RFC 3456, um, when it first came out and you look back today, they're exactly the same. So there's no question of the right thing. This is unlike some standards bodies where the standard for Ethernet, for example, is still called the same thing, and yet it's a very different document than it was a decade ago. Uh, the RFCs, RFC 1, 2, 3, 4, is going to always be the same set of text that it was when it was published. If we want to do an update to that RFC or we want to um, do a, a revision or a replacement, it's given a new RFC number. The original number stays, the original document stays. Document format is ASCII. It's plain text. That's the old one. That's the old format. The new format is an XML-based thing, but it's really the, the canonical form is uh, ASCII text. It's a, English is the official language, but pointing, the arrow is pointing to a provision in the, legal, in the legal provisions from the IETF Trust that says anybody can translate any IETF document in any language they want to without requiring any kind of permission, as long as you're publishing it in its entirety. You can publish extracts, that's what the bottom arrow is, you can publish extracts as long as you properly acknowledge the IETF and that those are true extracts. You can't publish a modif modified extract. So you can take some subsection and say, the IETF says this or the standard says this, and properly acknowledge the fact that it came from the IETF, but you can't modify it. There's, for many years, there was a almost constant discussion of alternate formats to doing something where you could draw a picture, for example. The early RFCs had pictures. There's an example of one here, that's RFC 1434. Uh, this is a, what is called ASCII art. It is really an art form. It's really hard to do. You have to have good drugs to come up with some of this stuff. Um, and it was seen as very behind the times. Uh, we were derided because we weren't using Microsoft Word or, or Postscript or something else to draw to be our standards document format. Uh, but it turns out that all of those formats have changed over time. Anybody who used early Microsoft Word has documents they can no longer read because Microsoft Word no longer supports the old formats. But the old format RFCs have been exactly the same for 44 years uh, and, and still continue today even after that. Uh, that's, nobody else can say that, but 
despite all of that, we do now have an alternate format, an XML based format, which allows you to have real pictures in it, real line drawings. Uh, we still produce the text ASCII based format, and that's the one that mostly will people will be seeing as the canonical, the, the official version. But the other version, the XML version, is just as official. It's just that it's it's not the same. It's it's not supported in quite the same way. It looks like it looks like a pretty picture, but the final result is if you have any ambiguity, it's the text-based version. Internet drafts are have file names, and the file names are useful because they tell you what the status and origin of the internet draft is. All of internet drafts start off with the word draft dash, uh, which says they're internet drafts. If it's a document that you personally wrote, uh, something that's your, that it's your musing, your individual idea, it's not within a working group, you then put it, the next element being your last name. So draft dash fan, for example, is a particular one. If you are targeting this internet draft at a particular working group, you think a particular working group is the right place to look at this, you can then add as the next element in the file name the working group name. So draft-fan-ops uh, area working group uh, is an example of that. And then you have the remainder of the file name is the topic of the document. So if it's not targeted to a working group, you don't have, a working, you don't have to have a working group name there. But if it is targeted to a working group, it's useful to have the working group name there because then the automated processes uh, list that internet draft along with a, as a, along with a working group list of documents uh, on the website. If it is a working group document, then it's draft dash IETF dash working group name. So draft dash IETF ops area working group dash firewalls, where the topic of the document is firewalls. So we have the subject there, and then you've and appended to that you have version number starting with zero zero. Uh, incrementing for each version and ending with .txt because it's plain ASCII text file. Here's some example names. Draft-IETF-IDR-BGP4-26. That was the 26th revision of the BGP4 specification. It took a long time to do that. Um, it, that was the last version before it was published as an RFC. But it was a IDR, Internet Domain Routing Working Group. That's what the IDR stands for. And it was an IETF working group document. Have draft dash Bradner dash RFC 3979 BIS 05. That's the fifth version of my proposed update to one of the IPR documents in the IETF, 30, RFC 3979. Not a working group document, so it was under my own name. It's an individual submission. And then you have the IAB or the IRTF can create their own documents. Draft-IAB-RFC format requirements-03 was a version of the IAB's document on what the requirements for the RFC formats are. The, this is part of the document that series that led to the RFC format, that the new, the new RFC format done in XML. The, there are different types of RFCs, standards track RFCs, and informational RFCs, experimental, historical. Those are the basic types. Note that you cannot tell the exact type of an RFC or its current status just by looking at the RFC. If we have a technical specification, let's say for example NetBlit was a technical specification, but it turned out to me that that particular technology is very decremental to the internet. It doesn't do congestion control. So it's been withdrawn as a standard. And in the index it says this is historical. It's not, not recommended for implementation. But because we never change the RFCs themselves, it still says standards track up in the corner, upper left hand corner of the RFC itself. So you have to go to the index to find out exactly what the current standard is when you're looking at something. Under informational, we have technical specification requirements, which are not the same things as the specifications themselves. Other background material, corporate documentation, companies can publish RFCs that document their proprietary protocol for the community if they think that the community would benefit from that, even if they're not giving away any rights to that technology. There's some works from other SDOs, 
for many years, other standards development organizations did not provide free access to their standards. So some of the standards from ISO were republished as RFCs as a mechanism to let them be more generally available. That's, that's toned down re in recent years because most standards bodies now make their material available, at least the final material available for free. Uh, but it still happens occasionally. And then there's April Fool's Day jokes. This started when John Postel, who was then the RFC editor, published a RFC called uh, the Telnet Randomly Lose Option. This was a document that looked exactly like a standard technology specification, except what the technology was proposing was one that if the, if the feature was turned on, it would randomly throw away characters. Now, it's not something you would really want to do in the real world, but it was an interesting concept. And John published that on April, April 1st, April Fool's Day, one year. Since then, on and off, not every year, uh, the RFC editor has published such a document. Uh, I have a few documents in this series. Uh, a student of mine and I co-wrote something called the Firewall Enhancement Protocol which allows you to bypass firewalls by putting TCP IP over HTTP directly. Uh, when we published that, we got a lot, of, a lot of email on it, and some of that email said, good joke. Others wanted implementations, because actually it's a useful function. And if you do an April Fool's Day RFC properly, then people will be confused. They will think that uh, it's a real, a real document, a real specification, until they look at what the publication date is. So another one I have is uh, something called the, Omnis the Omniscience Protocol Requirements. This came from a statement by U.S. Senator Orrin Hatch, who said he wanted to destroy the computers of copyright infringers. And when asked, he said, yes, I mean destroy. Well, if you're going to destroy somebody's computer, you better be awfully sure that that computer is, is being used for nefarious purposes. So you need to be omniscient. You need to know that that song on that computer is there not because they, they, the computer owner purchased it, but because they stole it. And that omniscience is required for that. Uh, got that when that got published, I got slash dotted. I got written up in slash dot on that, and I got a lot of flamage. People thought that I was actually proposing a serious proposal to support Orrin Hatch's vision of being able to destroy user computers. Uh, and I was being seen as in bed with Orrin Hatch, which is an image I didn't really want to have. But uh, it was a lot of flames. But it finally died down. The people realized it was a joke when they read it that it required to be able to be operated when the computers were offline. So it had to use wormhole routing and things like that. But it took a while to figure that out. Experimental RFCs are ones that aren't really ready for people to use in the real world. We're trying to experiment to see whether they're actually going to work. Uh, this is a little bit of running code concept that we want to make sure that technology actually works before we standardize it and move it on. Historical generally means we don't recommend it. The IETF doesn't recommend it, even though it was recommended at the time it was adopted. Under standards track, there's two standards track types. There is a best current practices standards track. It's sort of a one-step standards track, which includes policies and procedures that state the best way we know how to do something. It doesn't mean we're actually doing it this way at the time, but it was the best way we can consider doing something. This is a piece of the RFC index, and it's outlining two of the best current practices RFCs. They are the standards processed RFCs themselves. So RFC 2026 is a best current practice. RFC 2026 is the basic rule set under which the IETF functions. The other standards track is the technical standards track. It used to be a three-stage track, and the picture you show on the left shows a proposed standard, a draft standard, and an internet standard, as those we used to be the three steps. The middle step has been removed, so now we have a proposed standard, which is not, as somebody might read it, something that is being proposed for standard. It is a standard at the proposed level. And this means that the working group or the individual has gone through the full processes of making something a standard, but there's no guarantee that it's been implemented. And so it's a fully, fully baked idea. We know it's a good idea. 
any problems that we knew about were, have been, were fixed in the specification before it was published. But we don't have a lot of deployment experience. We're really not, not absolutely sure it's going to work. And we're also not really sure that the document itself is clear. Internet standard, which is the final step in the standards process, the old three-step or the new two-step standards process, requires multiple interoperable implementations of the technology in order to proceed from proposed to, to internet standard. The reason for the multiple interoperable implementations is to make sure that the document itself is clear. If I implement this, doc, this technology from the RFC and you implement it from the RFC and our implementations can interoperate, that means the RFC was clear because we both designed it the same way and we both make it, made it work the same way. We're not trying to say the popularity contest, the multiple implementations, is because it shows that it's popular. Popularity isn't what determines whether something's a standard. Technical clarity does. And it's been running. So they, you get to be a, you get, your document gets to be a standard. If it's been at the previous level, proposed standard, it's been stable for a while. It seems to be beneficial to the internet community and their implementations. And now note that we say interoperability here. We don't say conformance. The IETF looked at doing conformance many years ago. In the first days of TCPIP, there were a lot of companies out that did conformance testing to ensure that implementations conform to the standard, standards process, stand, the technical standard itself. But what happened was, yes, they, they met the requirements of the technical standard, but they didn't operate. It was, meant it was relatively useless. We found that it was much more important to figure out that these two implementations interoperated. They can talk to each other. An implementation of TCP can talk to another implementation of TCP than it was that each one of them by themselves met some definition of what the standard was.